We are tuned in to Fitness and Consciousness. Today's episode is called Holding Space for the Void. I had this idea of from when we let there be room for someone to leave our lives and, you know, come back or when we don't have to have a reaction to certain situations, then that will give the space for what we would like to happen to happen. I'm going to explain this in um, several different ways coming at it from uh, several angles, kind of like I normally do trying to make sense of these, this concept in different ways. So there's the, uh, the old saying like uh, nature abhors a vacuum. And I just looked it up a minute ago and it comes from Aristotle, but there, you know, it's like kind of literally talking about physics and they didn't have all the physics uh, nailed down back then and still don't. But as a philosophical concept, I think it makes a lot of sense when we have someone, you know, break up with us, our girlfriend breaks up with us and then, and then what? So we often want to try to make it work. It's, it usually doesn't happen as like our girlfriend breaks up with us and then like, okay. And then just move along like, um, it doesn't have any effect that it leaves this void. And if we hold space for that void, then that will allow other things to come into our life. And I have like this thought of, you know, if uh, it'd be nice to get to the point where if someone breaks up with us, then we can just, get on with it, get on with our, our lives, but there's something to learn uh, that we can take into the next relationship. There was this, uh, it ended up being this thing for like guys trying to get their exes back and stuff. But it, when it was first uh, presented, I, I, it didn't look like it was that, but it was like this thing for guys and, you know, um, this guy's trying to sell this course. And at, at first it just looks like, you know, ways that we can improve because there's a lot of uh, behaviors that are perceived by other people differently than what our intention is. You know, like I had uh, Kristen Babb on the podcast a few episodes back and she's, she was working on a, a documentary karma documentary.com uh, karma is a guide in nepal but anyway she's also a uh, works for a dating service where people go in and they're um, they talk to her for an hour or two and she sees their how they're presenting themselves on these uh, like dating apps or whatever it is and she sees the mistakes that people are making. They, they think it looks one way, but to everybody else, it looks a different way. Uh, given, anyways, if we have the like wherewithal to accept that moment, those mo accept that void, we can we can figure things out see things in a new light and then moving on we won't make those same mistakes but like this course that i got it was like you know all about trying to get your ex back and then like i said it didn't look like that at first and i didn't buy it or anything but at, at first i thought it had some useful information about guys seeming needy and you know women don't want a guy that's needy or at least most of them don't uh, probably healthier not to <clears throat> uh, 
there's um, sort of taking a, well, I'm coming at this from a bunch of different angles as usual. Um, I started getting into some old Persian poetry. Um, it was, I guess it has been for a while with Rumi and, uh, but I discovered this guy, uh, Galib, G A or uh, G H A L I B. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Galib, Galib, something like that. <clears throat> and I was looking at the, I saw someone post, it's this Muslim friend of mine and she posted on Facebook something about, uh, common translations of Rumi, especially by Burke, who happens to be a, a book that I have, are really not very accurate. They're not, they don't convey the right meaning. Uh, and then I started looking into it more and I got some different translations uh, coming to me uh, from the library. I think they're at the library waiting for me now, but I was at another library, at the library yesterday, and I picked up a bunch of uh, some uh, Persian poetry books. And this is from uh, Glebe, like I said, and I'll make more sense of all this as it, as it goes along. If you listen to the show, you, you know how it goes. I take the long way. <clears throat> but anyways, this song is called, this poem is called Rubbing My Forehead. Uh, now Glebe was born in 1797, 1227, 1797. And these Poems are ghazals, G-H-A-Z-A-L, and it means a conversation with the beloved, and there's a bunch of rules to it, which I, I, don't, I won't get into that. This song, this <laughs> poem, rather, it's called Rubbing My Forehead. She has a habit of torture, but doesn't mean to end the love. Such oppression is only teasing. We don't imagine it as a test. Which of my mouths shall I use to thank her for this delight? I know she inquires about me, even though no word is exchanged. The one who tortures likes us, and we like the torturers. So if she's not kind, we have to say she's not unkind. If you don't give me a kiss, at least curse at me. That means you have a tongue if you don't have a mouth. If your heart is still in one piece, cut your chest with a dagger. If eyelashes are not soaked with blood, put a knife in your heart. The heart is an embarrassment to the chest if it's not on fire. Releasing a breath brings shame if it's not a fountain of flame. Well, it's not a loss for me if my madness has destroyed our house. Giving up a large house for a wilderness is a good bargain. You ask me what is written on my forehead. It shows marks from being rubbed on the stone floor before some god. Gabriel sends praise to me for my poems. That happens even though Gabriel speaks a different language. For the price of one kiss, she sets my whole life. Because she knows Galib is only about half alive. Uh, that isn't part of it it's but i like that part the heart is an embarrassment to the chest if it's not on fire it's good stuff it's interesting what we'll put up with to not be alone you know there's prisoners you know, people will be in prison with these murderers and rapists and, you know, the worst that society has. And there's, you know, good people in, in prison too, I'm sure. But none of them want to be in solitary confinement. I'm assuming it's none. It's very, very few. It's like the worst thing you can do is put them in solitary confinement. They'd rather hang out with the murderers. Well, 
I know a lot of people know that, but man, think, think about that. So when we have this, these voids, you know, we're with someone for a year or maybe a lot of our life. Maybe we have kids with someone we're together for years and years and then it ends. And then like, what do we fill with that void? We want to So what do we fill with that void? I just had to hit pause. Here's like this knocking somewhere in the apartment building. <clears throat> but what will we fill with that void? So there's, you know, songs about uh, people, well, even if they're going to go through these traumas again with someone, even if they know they're going to be arguing and be given a hard time by their ex, they'll want them back. And sometimes people will, it's not sometimes, it's very common for someone to end a relationship. And then once there's some void, they want to be back in it. And they're the ones that said they didn't want to be in it before. And I've been in these kind of relationships. There was a couple of them uh, in, in particular where it was like the, my, we were together for about two years and there was just a, I'm not sure how many exactly breakups there were, but it was like in one day she would like talk about wanting to get married and have kids and then talk about how maybe we're not right for each other. And maybe we should break up and, and get married and break up. And it's like, why, why is that? And why do I, why, why would I put up with it for that long? You know, it's not like I'm a, a desperate guy and, you know, she's the only one that would ever like me. But we have this need for something. Even if it's not so good, it's better than nothing. Even something bad is better than nothing. You'd rather hang out with a killer than be by ourselves. So imagine the guys and women that go off into the caves by themselves or I don't know. I don't, I don't really think that's the that's the way. But there's um It's a Grateful Dead song called Foolish Heart. Carve your name, carve your name in ice and wind. Search for where, search for where the rivers end or where the rivers start. Do everything that's in you that you feel to be your part, but never give your love, my friend, unto a foolish heart. Leap from ledges. Leap from ledges high and wild. Learn to speak. Speak with wisdom like a child. Directly from the heart. Crown yourself the king of clowns or stand way back apart. But never give your love, my friend, unto a foolish heart. Shun a friend. Shun a brother and a friend. Never look. Never look around the bend or check a weather chart, sign the Mona Lisa with a spray can, call it art, but never give your love, my friend, unto a foolish heart. A foolish heart will call on you to toss your dreams away, then turn around and blame you for the way you went astray. A foolish heart will cost you sleep and often make you curse. A selfish heart is trouble, but a foolish heart is worse. Bite the hand, bite the hand that breaks you bread. Dare to leap where the angels fear to tread. 
till you are torn apart. Stoke the fires of paradise with coals from hell to start, but never give your love, my friend, unto a foolish heart. Unto a foolish heart. Words by Robert Hunter, music by Jerry Garcia. Not that you heard the music, but if you did, that's who it would be by. Um, I didn't uh, plan on reading this next one, but I just turned the page and it um, makes sense. Blow Away. Uh, it's a Grateful Dead song. A man and a woman come together as strangers. When they part, they're usually strangers still. It's like a practical joke played on us by our maker. Empty bottles that can't be filled. Baby, who's to say it could have been different now that it's done? Baby, who's to say that it should have been anyway? Baby, who's to say that it matters in the long run? Give it just a minute and it will blow away. It'll blow away. You fancy me to be the master of your feelings. You barely bruise me with your looks to kill. Though I admit we were sometimes brutal in our dealings, I never held you against your will. Your case against me is so clearly stated. I plead no contest. I just turn and shrug. I've come to figure all importance overestimated. You must mean water when you beg for blood. Like a feather in a whirlwind, blow away. Just as sure as the world spins, blow away. When I was looking at these, I don't know if I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, when I'm like looking at these, yeah, I did mention it a little bit, but these translations of these old old poems from uh, you know Persian. I have some Sanskrit ones here to read in a, in a little bit. There's often debate on how these things are, are translated. So you have these people, they're not claiming, oh, this person doesn't even know how to speak this language. Why are they pretending that these are the words that are written? Then these interpretations. And think about that. Here's an example. Um, one of the, when I was looking for, uh, I went to Half Price Books and I was um, going to buy some, um, I didn't end up buying any, because like, you know, library's free and I didn't see anything that I wanted to buy anyways. Well, there was one that I thought I wanted to buy. It said, um, the Vikings book of poetry. And I thought, oh, wow, this sounds cool. But then when I looked at it, it was uh, like Vikings, like the, the publisher, and the poems were not by the Vikings. So it ruined it. <clears throat> but anyways, here's a, a translation. I was looking at the, I think it's pronounced Rubayat. Uh, it's probably not quite right. But by Omar Khayyam, it's a very famous uh, um, Islamic uh, poem. When I was reading, like one, like it was by Fitzgerald, and then I was reading this other thing by Robert Graves and Omar Ali Shah. Omar Ali Shah, and it said that the Fitzgerald translation wasn't accurate. Here's an example of. A Fitzgerald translation. Awake, for morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight, and lo, the hunter of the east has caught the sultan's turret in a noose of light. Same thing, but Graves' translation. Wild dawn, day's herald straddling the whole sky, 
offers the drowsy world a toast to wine. The sun spills early gold on city roofs, day's regal host replenishing his jug. I mean, is that anywhere close to the same thing? So what I've been what I've been doing is I want to get these ancient poets I want to I want to learn about them. I want to really know uh what they meant. But if we can have two people saying that this is the translation and it's not even close to the same. It's hard to get to. Uh who am I supposed to believe? It's not like I, I speak these ancient Persian languages. I, I forget what language it was written in. Uh, whatever. Um, I forget. Adur or, or, or Duel or something like that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not bother looking for it right now. <clears throat> but it, then it's okay if I, if I read a part that I like and it's not – the correct translation. It's just someone else's interpretation of what they, what it meant to them. And I've talked about it on the podcast many times, how difficult it is to express ourselves. Bruce Lee said to express yourself honestly is very, very difficult. And so imagine trying to express what somebody else is saying. Uh, now, some people are more apparent um, about it than others. One of them is by, uh, many of you probably know who Paramahansa Yogananda is. And so he wrote a book from uh, Moments of Truth, Volume 1, Excerpts from the Rubaiyat, um, Explained. So, and then in it right away, it says that this isn't really the translation. It's... Um, uh, how does he put it exactly? He doesn't, uh, I won't find the exact way he puts it, but um, yeah, okay. So it says uh, the excerpt here, excerpts here are contained, here contained are not from the poem itself, but from the commentary. These are words to live by, <clears throat> wise insights by one of the great spiritual figures of our times. Uh, as Yogananda explains in the Rubaiyat explained, Omar Khayyam's work is deeply spiritual. It is not, as most Westerners believe, a poem in praise of earthly treasures, pleasures, taking the inner meaning of his, this work to ever greater depths. Paramahansa Yogananda produced one of his own deepest and most profoundly moving spiritual works. So, It's like the like the, the poems he wrote about the poems that he read, <laughs> basically. Uh, but there were a couple of them in here I like. So I'm trying to like dig into like what all this stuff means and um, here's part of the like from the, the one I just said. What a travesty of religion to allow the sweetness of inner silence to be drowned in the clang and hubbub of temple lectures, theologians, arguments, and noisy rituals. I like that. Every thought we think is a flower in life's garden and not the permanent possession of anyone. Let our thoughts then be fragrant and beautiful, not rank and ugly, that the memory we leave behind us be felt as a blessing on the earth. That's a segue to my next story here. So as I've explained before, um, I have what I call my job job. And I work from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, sometimes more. Uh, and then I'm a strength and conditioning instructor and I do that um, in the afternoons and evenings. And then, 
well, so the, I work on this machine, I work like, it's like a, a factory. It's a pretty good job, really. And there's, the main operator of this machine, there's usually four or five of us on this uh, machine. And, you know, he gets in my face and yells at me about stuff. And usually I just let it go. And I, but I've said to him many, many times, you can't talk to me like that. You have to quit talking to me like that. There's no reason for it. And he, he's not asking me to do anything unreasonable. I've never had any problem with what he asked me to do. Um, but the way he freaks out and gets up in my face and yells at me, it's insane. And so today I'd had enough by 530 in the morning, he'd gotten in my face twice and yelled at me. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to go talk to the supervisor. It's like this, this isn't happening anymore. <clears throat> And so we go and we, and he's like, fine, let's go talk to him. And so we track him down. And, you know, we go into this room to talk and the supervisor said, okay, well, what's going on? And the main operator of the machine, he just like, like, most gestures for me, like, go ahead, just go ahead and tell him. And it's like, well, he keeps getting in my face and yelling at me. <laughs> and it's happened twice today already. It was 5 30 in the morning, and it, we were there for 30 minutes, and it's already happened twice. And, and I was like, it's just really inappropriate. And so the operator, he's like sitting down, uh, like eight feet away, away from me or something like that. And I'm standing up. And he gets up and then he like gets really close to me and starts like saying like, well, this is how I do it. This is how I do it. Trying to like demonstrate that like what he does is so reasonable, not knowing that what he was doing <laughs> is completely irrational. And so the, the supervisor, he like, like put his hand out, like, like almost like he's going to like stop a fight from happening, which when he comes towards me, I, I turn to the side. I'm not trying to like meet his aggression with aggression. So I am, it, it would be a, a completely different scene if I turned to face him. And I've done it a, a couple times when I, but I would say calmly not to talk to me like that. I don't, bark at him i don't try to like um be the a tough guy i I just stand there like um i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna lose my cool and end up losing my job or for something silly or to let this thing get out of hand anyway and so the supervisor <clears throat> You know, he like puts his arm out like to like keep the operator like to have him like back away from me because clearly this is inappropriate. And then he tells him to like, uh, like go ahead and like leave the room. And then he tells me, he's like, oh, I'm going to put you on a different, um, I'm going to put you somewhere different for today. And then you can talk to the manager later on. And so I, no problem. I'll do whatever they ask me. They want me to run some machine I'll run some machine if they want me to sweep the floor I'll sweep the floor I don't care I'm 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 just there it's my it's just it's just a job I'm there to do my work and I don't really care what it is and so I go to this other machine and the operator there he, they're they're real cool I, I've I've been over there before and they're they've always been perfectly cool they've never <laughs> yelled at me so when uh, 
who was leaving after he left, like the supervisor, he was like, yeah, he, he can't, he can't do that. You know, he's demonstrating clearly how rational he is. <laughs> he's trying to show how rational he is. But yeah, anyways, no, I was telling the man, uh, supervisor, I was like, ultimately I'd like for things to just be able to smooth out. And, um, he, but, and he started like say, well, but sometimes, and then he, he didn't really go on. So I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. I just, uh, enough is enough, you know? So <clears throat> with these other, and, I, and I've said many times to him, I was like, you're the only person in my life that does this. Nobody else gets in my face and yells at me. No one does that. And then, but and that makes him mad. Like, like this is, is like a normal thing that people do. And I think he's, he's going through a divorce and, and stuff. And so, and, and I've said like, I didn't say anything about that specifically, but I've said this has to affect you in other ways of your life. And maybe that's, not the greatest thing for me to say, but I'm trying to like point out to him out of the goodness of my heart <laughs> that uh, this behavior of yours is probably sc screwing up your life all sorts of ways. I'm trying to help. So after a while, enough is enough. So I think... Um, you know, when I've made some the, the point before, I think people generally need to be more sensitive and less sensitive. So we need to be more sensitive in how we treat people and con considering them. And we need to be less sensitive about uh, how people treat us. So... Otherwise, there's like nothing but conflict. I mean, if you want to get in some kind of arguments, get on Facebook, put, there's all kinds of like political arguments. People spend hours and hours typing stuff out, arguing with people that they don't even know. It's just like this argument algorithm thing happening. But after a while, enough is enough. And so today after doing that, I, I, thought you know I, I played it right and even the the operator who has you know gotten my face and yelled at me all these times he's came up to me before other days and he said you handled that right he's like when I'm being a jerk he's used a different word but he's like when I'm being a jerk just say hey you're being a jerk uh, but he said I handled it right, that situation right before so at some at some level he is aware of what he's doing and he wear he wears like a cross around his neck um it's usually i think it's usually tucked in because we're not supposed to have can't have jewelry because it can get caught in the machines and stuff and on his keychain there's a cross and so this tells me they're thinking they're they're trying they're but people are at like different levels of this game So when we're in these relationships and then there's this void. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> back to uh, Galib. So again, this stuff is over 200 years old or well, yeah, however old it is. He was born in 1797. And so I bring up that situation at work because I think we have these re repeating patterns. Um, where if we have, if we see these things keep coming up, then maybe it's us. Maybe these other people aren't the problem, or at least we're, we could be part of the problem too. First of all, like what we allow. Um, I think we need to give people give people space to mess up, to be human and not 
and not judge them. Because in, in the morning, he'll say, good morning, Ryan. You know, a lot of the times, 20 minutes later, he might be in my face yelling at me. Or he'll say, have a good weekend or good job today or something like that. So, and I always try to just always reset. I'm not trying to like carry that, uh, any kind of animosity or grudge with, with what he's did before. I'm not like dreading being there with him. Uh, but <clears throat> after a while, enough is enough. So we see this in different parts of our lives <clears throat> for sure. And I would not have a girlfriend that talks to me like that. There's no way. You can allow a little freak out every once in a while. <clears throat> but after this uh, last relationship that I had, when I, not the last one I had, but it was when I was, I won't say who it was, but when I was uh, in my early 20s, it was one where like we yell at each other and call each other names and stuff. And then I've thought it was pretty much her fault because it was. But after that, I was like, there's no way I'm doing that again. I'd rather be by myself. And I was by myself for a long time because I wanted somebody that was you know, pretty much perfect. And then the relationships I had then have had since then not calling each other names, not yelling and th that kind of thing. They've all been peaceful and they've had peaceful endings. But anyways, this uh, is a poem from Glebe. On waiting for God. My lover's temperament resembles the fires of hell. I must be an unbeliever because I enjoy this burning. It's hard to say how long I've been in this wasteland, especially if I count the nights of separation. Would there be no more sleep ever because she promised in my dream she would meet me in real life? My message hasn't received a reply, so I guess I'll write another. I think I know what the great one will say anyway. In her poetry gatherings, the great one never passes the cup to me. Now I hold it. I hope no one has mixed anything in the wine. How can you cheat someone who doesn't even accept the concept of love? If I have a rival, it's mad of me to be jealous of him. At the moment of reunion with her, I think of my rival. My suspicion has taken away the joy of her presence. How many loves can match the moment she turns her glance away? How many gold rings can match one instant of her anger? When we watch a mirage, ships appeal, appear to sail forward. Such magic will be no help to me in achieving what I want. Glebe, we've given up wine, but sometimes we still do drink. For example, on cloudy days or nights of the full moon. And uh, as I'm reading these uh, about the inter interpretations and uh, translations, like wine doesn't just mean wine. It could be spiritual wine. It could be, um, and the like. Uh, the beloved could be God, beloved could be a woman, beloved can mean different things. And different people say it means different things. So it's like, what kind of, what kind of sense does it make to you today? Maybe when you read it in a month or a year and five years, you'll look back at it and see a completely different meaning. about limits and meanings still from uh, Glebe. This book is called the lightning should have fallen on Glebe uh, translated from the Urdu by Robert Bly and Sunil Dutta. Dutta. Um, hope I pronounced that correct. About limits and meanings. When the great one gestures to me, the message does not become clear. When love words are spoken, I get six or seven meanings. I must tell you, God, this woman doesn't grasp my meaning. Give her a second heart, please, if you don't give me a second tongue. Her eyebrows do make a bow, but the rest is unclear. What are her eyes, an arrow or something else? You come into town and I still grieve. 
of course I can go to the market and buy another heart and another life. I'm good at smashing rocks with my head. But it looks as if someone on this street has been strewing boulders. My soul is full and it would be good to drain the blood. The problem is limits. I have only two eyes. Even though my head flies off, I love to hear her voice. And she remarks to the executioner, you're doing well. <laughs> People get a real sense of what the sun is like when I let the light reflect off one of my scars. I could have had some peace had I not fallen in love with you. If I hadn't died, I could have done a lot more crying and sighing. A river keeps rising when its bed is not available. When my nature becomes damned, it just keeps moving. We know there is more than one good poet in the world, but the experts say that Galil, Galib's little jests are great. Um, <clears throat> here's just a part at the, at the beginning. I haven't read this whole book yet, but I liked this um, little thing as I was skimming through. Uh, I'll write this letter even though it may not have a message. I'll send it just because I'm a lover of your name. And getting back to the, the holding space, I was somewhat fascinated by this idea of holding space for some time. I remember this girlfriend I had several years back and I, she would talk about it. She was a yoga teacher and I always thought there was like, there's like so much to dig into about this concept of holding space. Like you're, you're given someone the space to have whatever emotions they have, talk about it in whatever language they want to use, and you're you're not judging that. You're just being with them as that happens. And and like Jordan Peterson, who's a, a clinical psychologist, and uh, you know he says people learn by think or uh, people think by talking. And a lot of time he said, don't underestimate the value of just listening to someone. And even in his practice, he says that when, you know, it, it, it's, he, he's not just there to give someone the answers to their problems. He's there to listen. And then they often come up with the answers themselves. And that way it's their win and not his. Uh, so given someone the space to figure things out by themselves. And sometimes it just takes us a while to get there, doesn't it? As so we go on some kind of trip through, you know, like the, um, the course I was talking about earlier that I started and I saw that it was just like a thing about getting your ex back mostly. But we go through these things where when, when we're left with this void, our girlfriend breaks up with us or whatever, we're trying to fill that, that void, even if it's with something that's not good for us, like her, she's already said she's done. She's already, it's like, why do you want that? Well, that's better than nothing. At least I have something in, um, you know, at, um, there's a song, some of the songs that my dad played and recorded, I didn't know if he wrote them. Um, some of them I, I found out were written by someone else later. He didn't try to pass them off as his own or anything, but, um, but like there was a, a song, I wish that I could hurt that way again. I don't think he wrote that one. Um, even, uh, I wish that I could hurt that way again, even though I'd always lose and you would win. Um, and this like, 
and something like at least my eyes could watch you walk away you know like when you're it's yeah what else is there to say about that there's if we leave that cha- if we leave that void though and we're not chasing something that is going away from us and sometimes that chasing makes something go away makes something or you know someone go away from us um this uh i think it was the same the same yeah the same girlfriend that i was talking about earlier she was the yoga teacher and from uh, several years ago it, she was talking about how we were talking to each other how we were like getting through different things and she was like if i like kept coming to her then that might make her like close up but if i like back off then she'll she'll be the one that comes to me and that and i i could see how that that works when um giving allowing that void giving her the the space to then uh come back and um you know in these cases it wasn't like her just breaking up and i'm like letting her come back but more like we're we're trying to talk about something or i don't remember all the um situations but it was mostly give the space for them to come to you uh And I think that's something that a lot of, maybe it's something like guys do more than women. I'm not sure, but where we like try so, try too hard and do too much. And then it it pushes them away. Whereas if we had some left a little void there, if we left a little space, then they'll, they'll come to us but we can't do it as a way of being manipulative. Like it's it's just a way to um, understand how that works. But you still have to be honest. If you use it for, if you use that knowledge, power for evil, it'll come back to you. <clears throat> but we'll, if we have that void, and then something good comes up, then we realize. Oh, this is a lot better than asking um, for the pain again. Uh, this book is uh, is called Sanskrit Poetry by from uh, Vidyakara's Treasury, translated by Daniel H. H. Ingalls. And there seems to be a bunch of different people's uh, translations in here, actually. Uh, But I think about like the, the good that can happen if we if we leave that void, if we get, hold space for that void. Her glances, her glances first came hesitant and sidelong, then soft and shy with love. A while they rested on me motionless, then slowly turned away. Her pupils widening behind long lashes told of the admiration that she felt. My heart, poor thing without defense, was captured, cut up, swallowed, and now is lost for a... That's by Bava Beauty. I'm not sure how old these are. I think they're really old though. Um, There was... Got a bookmark here and I can't find. Uh, let's look. Some of these are kind of risque, these old Sanskrit poems. I'm going to be digging more into, into these 
Um, I just got these books yesterday and been going through them. Um, there's uh, um, this part of the um, okay. This is on called Good Men. And it starts with uh, the verses of this section and the next, as well as many from the section 33, belong to that branch of literature which the Indians call Niti. Niti uh, means worldly wisdom, the art of getting along in the world. Um, I just had, oh. Uh, who can understand the hearts of the truly great, which are harder than diamonds and softer than flowers? Bhava beauty. Not everything is good because it is old, nor poems always bad by being new. Good men try both before they make their choice, while the few, well, <laughs> sorry. Not everything is good because it is old, nor poems always bad by being new. Good men try both before they make their choice, while the fool but takes the view of others. There's a lot of good stuff to dig in with that one. Um, I have one more thing to read. Now, most of what I try to do, if if you listen to this show, I talk about relationships a lot, and I, th I think they're the most important things in our life. Our relationship with our self, our relationship with our um, partners, our life partners, and you know, business partners, coworkers. It and our, our friends, and it, it, it really makes up how our life goes. And when you can find someone, and there's someone in, in my life, and I, I, I find her really interesting, and she, I've described her before. I've, I've mentioned her on the show quite a few times, but I usually describe her as um, a, a friend, and we've been more than friends before. But we're, we're friends now, and um, not really trying for anything more, not really resisting or trying for anything more. Um, we have kind of, a, it's, it's an interesting story to me. And she wrote, she sent me a text tonight and today and Let's see, I don't give too much away. I, I do try to have some sort of, I probably say too much on this show about some people sometimes. But, well, it, it was something like, I, she, she teaches yoga and, and I was going to her class. And then she's, she mentioned coming to my class tonight um, like to uh, train like martial arts and and she said you know I can still come to her class and she thought maybe I quit coming because I was just trying to like be with her and then we had this like kind of weird conversation where it was like in between like being more than friends and then going to just as friends and there were some things that were not obvious um, in that uh, transition. And so I explained to her, no, that's not why I quit coming. It was, you know, some other things to do, got out of the habit. And I was like, and we've hung out 
many, many times since. And so was, I'm, I'm like wondering, like, how does that, like, maybe it just kind of hurts her feelings a little bit that I, that I'm not, that I haven't been coming to her class, but it's like part of this thing that, you know, I'm, I'm not reading these poems, but I was also trying to say, you know, are these good translations? You know, I, I read from Paramahansa Yogananda and it says it's, it's not a translation really. It's the poems that he wrote from the poems that he read uh, from the Rubaiyat. Um, and in that book, it, it, I read two trans, translations of a verse that seemed to have like, how are these, how did they come up with this? It's not like one word's a little different. It's like the whole thing is different. So it's not, it, it's really hard, I think, to truly understand somebody. But when, when you try and you keep trying, then, you know, you, you're going to get closer and closer if, if you're really doing that and, and you're given the space to do that. You're, you're holding space for that information to come in instead of uh, attacking with your point of view. Like, no, you said this, this is what you said, this is what you meant, this is what happened, this is what, and they're saying, that's not what happened, that's not what I said, that's not what I meant. This is by Tagore. It's the last, uh, thing I'll read for today. I could speak to her on a day like this, on a day when it rains as heavily. You can open your heart on a day like this, when you hear the clouds as the rain pours down in gloom unbroken by light. Those words won't be heard by anyone else. There's not a soul around, just us face to face in each other's sorrow, sorrowing as water streams without interruption. It's as if there's no one else in the world. This earthly webs as untrue as the constant noise of life. Only our eyes drinking their own nectar as the heart feels what's only true to the heart. All else melts in the dark. Surely no one in the world would come to harm if I rid my mind of this burden. If I said a couple of words to her in one corner of this room in the Shravan's downpour, surely the world would remain unaffected. The day passes in anxious ways, lit by flashes of lightning. Now the time it seems I could say the words that all my life I'd kept to myself on such a day when it rains heavily. Translated by Amit Chaudhuri. So maybe when this friend of mine took my actions in a way that I'm not saying is true, maybe there is some truth to it. And I said that there, you know, there, there was a time in between being a little bit more than friends and then just being friends that it, it takes some processing and then but, you know, so there's levels to this. And like, what level are we talking to, talking from? What part of us is listening? Is it the, the part of us that is open and ready for something new? Is it the part of us that's still hurt from something that happened before from someone else? Is it the, the part of us as a child where something happened and we never got over it? I forget how I started that. Um, but so maybe this, her, um, 
thinking is, all right, well, all these other guys are trying to get something else. They're, they're trying to hook up with her. And so they're like saying or doing all these things. And as those relationships go through their waves, like, oh, it's this. No, it's not. Oh, it's this. No, it's not. Oh, and then now I got what this guy's all about. Then when she's looking at the next guy or the next like friend or more than friend or me, it, how, how difficult is it to just open openly without Um, these ghosts that I call them without these ghosts of the past. Like, okay, I said something. Well, that other guy said that too. And he ended up being um, a really bad guy. So when, when we're perceiving someone else, it, it's kind of hard not to, through the experience of our past. And that's gonna be a good thing, but it might cause problems also. <clears throat> so the overall idea for this show is to hold, spo hold space for the void and let the things come in and then let, and let things go. And it's, it's hard to tell what, what, which is which and because there's, you know, should we keep fighting for this thing to work or should we not bother anymore? If someone says no, you say, okay, and, I'm, and then on to the next one, or do you say no? And they're like, well, it's because you're not understanding me. Um, like from that one poem from Galib that I read earlier, she might be worth repeating that line. Um, she um, uh, let's see I don't have a handy here um, let's see sorry Oh, um, I must tell you, God, this woman doesn't grasp my meaning. Give her a second heart, please, if you don't give me a second tongue. We'll leave it at that. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time.